So this, let me just say, whoever came up with the idea of Mac bids is a genius. And I want to meet them or her. I want to meet them. Does anybody, you probably, a lot of you don't know what Mac bids is. All right. All right. So this is the deal. Have you ever returned anything? Like the Amazon or Home Depot or something? Right, right. What happens to that? Okay, maybe it didn't work. Maybe it didn't fit. Maybe you didn't just like it. Uh, maybe you had some kind of flaw. So you return it, right? Where does it go? It goes to a place called Mac Bids. And Mac Bids puts that item for auction. So they get at least something out of it. Because they can't sell it as new anymore. So you, you bid on these items. And uh, if you win the bid, then, of course, you win the item. Now, bidding and buying something from Mac Bids is not without risk. It's not without risk. There's the possibility that the item was returned because it had some kind of flaw or the original owner damaged it in some way. Now, they're supposed to reveal that, but sometimes they don't. For example, that happened to us bidding on a vacuum for the congregation. When I got the vacuum, it was a train wreck. It, was, it still had, they vacuumed with it. <laughs> and they hadn't emptied it. And then it was broken and everything. So they took it back. Uh, but that's what happens sometimes. That's the risk factor. Our portion from today's parsha and more, to speak, it challenges our feelings on handling defects, from physical defects to moral and spiritual defects. And it doesn't seem to matter to God whether it's the Kohanim, the priests, or the animals used in sacrifices. Both had to be free of what is in Hebrew a mum, a mum or a defect. It made no difference if the mum or defect was the result of a natural condition from birth or, or perhaps caused by an accident. And the rule was that anything that approached God had to be as perfect as possible. In Hebrew, tamim, from the root tam, which means perfect or defect-free. Reading from Vayikra or Leviticus 22, verse 21, whoever brings a sacrifice of peace offerings to Adonai in fulfillment of a vow or as a voluntary offering, whether it come from the herd or from the flock, we've spoken that not too long ago, it must be unblemished or a perfect tamim and without defect or mum in order to be accepted. Now, certainly, one of the reasons for this was that the people were not to bring that which would be their leftovers, their second best, their throwaway stuff, the stuff you would donate, give away at a garage sale or something. No, they, they couldn't bring their undesirables to present to God. For a sacrifice to be meaningful and acceptable, for it to be a sacrifice, it had to be valuable to you. It had to be valuable. But apart from the value, the perfect nature of these offerings reveals much to us about God, much to us about his creation, much to us about the Messiah and ourselves. First, by insisting that these animals were not broken with any blemishes or deformities or disease, we're reminded that God himself has no de defects. God has no weaknesses. God has no faults. God is not second best. We tend to lower the bar, brothers and sisters, creating religion and spirituality that accommodates our own imperfect nature. We see that so much today. We see it in education. We see that in spirituality. We lower the bar rather than raise the bar. We should struggle to reach the bar, not lower it, not lessen its significance. And yet that's what we see so much today. God calls us to something much higher, much higher. God is perfect. 
So what we offer to him must be in the same spirit of perfection and quality. To offer him anything less is to lower God to our level rather than raise ourselves up to his level. Remember, this world was created perfectly. And the imperfections and blemishes of life are a result of human rebellion against the creator. By bringing our best offering, whether possessions or labor, we are confronted with an ideal that once was, but can be and will be again. For that to take place, repairing broken perfection requires what? Perfection. You fix broken perfection with perfection. You don't use something broken to begin with to attempt to fix something broken, do you? Can and can't fix your car if the ratchet is broken or the screwdriver is stripped out. You can't use a broken tool to fix a broken item. Same for God. To repair what human rebellion broke, the tools of spiritual reparation used in the temple had to be blemish-free. Whether a a physical item, an animal, or the human element, the priest. But, of course, I know what's swimming around in your consciousness right now, you're thinking to yourself, but wait a minute. What human, you may be thinking, is perfect enough for God? Aren't we all broken morally and spiritually? Well, we know, we know that priests were capable of sinning. You think of Nadav and Avihu, they sinned by offering an illegal offering of incense. So they sinned. Eli's sons and Samuel's sons brought reproach by their ungodly behavior in the priesthood in the nation. That's why God required a sacrifice from priests for their sins before atoning work could be performed on behalf of the people. This had to be done on a daily basis, because God demands, hear me, God demands the very best. God demands your very best. He's offended. He is offended if an, either an offering was blemished or if the coney given the offering were blemished. So, The portion Yochanan read for us, John read for us, there are 12 physical defects that God singles out in our portion this morning, I believe are representative of 12 spiritual defects. And here's the key. If left unattended to, my belief is that they will seriously compromise and even potentially disqualify us from entering into the eternal Holy of Holies. Let's take a look at them. How about uh, blind? What does being blind mean in a spiritual sense? Well, it's obvious. You lack vision. You lack vision. Reading from the second letter that Peter wrote, Kepha Beit, chapter 1, verse 3 to 8, we get a number of characteristics that should be present in believers. A faith furnished with goodness. Goodness with knowledge. Knowledge with self-control. Self-control with perseverance. Perseverance with godliness. Godliness with brotherly affection. And brotherly affection with love. For if you have these qualities in abundance, they keep you from being barren and unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. Barren in the knowledge of Yeshua, the Messiah. It's interesting verbiage there. Barren. In Messiah Yeshua. And then in verse 9, Cephas says, Indeed, whoever lacks them is blind. So short-sighted that they forget that their past sins have been washed away. So in other words, apart from these qualities, we are unable to see things as God sees them. And therefore, what do we do? We stumble and we potentially fall in our walk with the Lord.
if we have a careless spiritual life, we will be spiritually blinded. Rabbi Shaul, the Apostle Paul, explains in his first letter to Corinth, chapter 2, spiritual things can only be discerned how? Spiritually. Spiritual things require spiritual vision. And with this in mind, reading from Proverbs 29, 18, we're reminded without a vision, the people, they perish. But those who keep the Torah are happy. Happy. Vision for yourself, your marriage, your family, your congregational family, because this is your family. This makes our being filled with the Ruach HaKodesh so critical because he provides us the vision we need to discern the direction in the Torah Hashem wishes to take us. So that takes care of blindness. How about lame? And that's not describing somebody you don't like. Okay. Lame. So how do we become lame? Here, injured because they fell into a pit. Person who is lame obviously will walk a little bit differently than normal people. And of course, it's no different than a spiritually lame believer. Their walk, their life is not consistent with what the word tells us a Messiah-like life should be, should look like. Their walk progresses much slower than should be normal for a maturing believer. We try to remind ourselves of that each year as we go through the cycle of holy days, especially Yom Kippur, right? We ask ourselves the question, here I am at Yom Kippur again, the Day of Atonement. Am I any different? All the, all the sins that I cast into that little stream over there for Tushlik, am I truly done with them? Or am I really just the same person and I'm just fooling myself? Am I still just walking kind of slowly along and not maturing? And not only that, but people like this are prone to wander off. Wander off the path. And when you wander off the path, what potentially happens is you fall into a ditch or you tumble down a ravine. Moving off the Lord's path is will keep you from walking upright and straight. So it's so important we listen carefully to God's directions, his word and his, his Torah, and then follow that Torah, follow his instructions, amen? Apply them to your life. You'll come here every Shabbat, those who I haven't scared away, and, and, you, and, and you hear what I have to say, but I, and, I, and it's good that the word goes forth, it doesn't come back void, but are you applying it to your life? Are you acknowledging, say, amen, amen, rabbi, or amen, okay. But what is different in your life as a result of what I just said? A lot of you will just dismiss what I say. Well, I don't agree with the rabbi, so I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. Well, you better challenge me in the word then, because then you, what you're saying by ignoring what I've just shared with you, that I'm wrong. So you, then you have a responsibility to correct me. That's being a good Berean, by the way. But then there's a third spiritual uh, flaw, if you may, a mutilated face, a flat nose. And that really refers to a lack of discernment. See, the first three offerings in Leviticus of Aikra, chapter 1 to 3, are the following. It's the Ola, or the burnt offering, the Mincha, or the grain offering, and the Zavach Shalamim, or the peace offering. Those are the first three offerings that were presented. And they are all called sweet savor or sweet aroma offerings and were such to the Lord. Do you even... Let me give you an example. Remember when your mom made you dinner, or maybe your dad, depends. My son still has an issue with something I served him to this day. I think he's going to need therapy at some point. <laughs> it, am I right? He comes up with it every time, not you. And uh, 
He literally threw up on the table. <laughs> but uh, do you ever have something that, that you were served and you said, oh, I can't eat that? For me, it was liver and onions. Sorry, I'm not a liver and onions guy. Oh, my gosh. When I saw liver and onions, I said, oh, what am I going to do? Get the dog in here. <laughs> I couldn't do liver and onions. Oh, my gosh, it was horrible. I, I probably need therapy. But anyway, so what do people tell you to do if you've got to eat something that's like it doesn't taste good or gags you or whatever? Hold your nose, right? You ever hear somebody ever tell you that? Just hold your nose. You'll be okay. Hold your nose when you eat it, right? <laughs> hold your nose. Well, yeah, I, that works. But uh, it helped you to sort of process something so you wouldn't taste how bad it really was to you. Now, one with a flat nose is not able to discern what is tasteful or distasteful to the Lord. It's staggering to me. Like, I, I was, do you realize that there is a, a pastor of a mega church that swears in his service? He cusses in his service. Do you think maybe that might be distasteful to the Lord and the people in attendance? Now, he's trying to be hip and cool. He's trying to get his message across. But that's true. That happened. I, I've watched the video. And uh, people didn't seem, he didn't seem to have an issue with it, and people didn't seem to have an issue with it. But that tells me he lacks discernment. It tells me that he doesn't understand what is distasteful to God and other people. But that's what's happening in the pulpits today. It would shock you. It would shock you what is going on with congregations that have two, three, four, five thousand people, what's being said theologically, what is being just declared in general. It would shock you. And nobody's getting it because they don't know whether it's distasteful or tasteful. They don't have that discernment. Now, the fourth spiritual defect, a limb that's too long. And of course, when we have a limb that's too long, you're out of balance, aren't you? You're out of balance. Typical for one that has a limb longer than the other. Now, most of us will agree it's difficult for us to maintain a balanced perspective. For example, some will stress love and grace. Love and grace. Is there any lack of love and grace in the pulpits today, right? No lack of love and grace. We are drowning in love and grace. And how do we balance that with holiness and righteousness? Are they balanced? Are you getting both messages equally, love and grace and holiness and righteousness? I don't think so. Yeshua was compassionate and is compassionate, and he is loving, no question about it. But in the same breath, Yeshua was committed to a holy, observant lifestyle. And we talked about that when I preached to you about whether I've offended, to you, offended you or not, and of course, gave you examples of where Yeshua and his passion for holiness and righteousness would be today very offensive, very offensive in his approach. But nonetheless, he balanced his message of love and grace with holiness and righteousness. He was gracious where we fell short, but demanded a sin-free life, life or walk. How often do we witness in the body an emphasis of certain truths to the exclusion of other truths? How much preaching is done today about sin? How much preaching is done today about hell? How much preaching is about condemnation? Yeshua is the word, the whole word. And rejecting part of the word is doing what? It's just common sense, kids. It's rejecting part of Messiah. 
You're taking portions of Messiah that you like, and you, you know, it's like you got you got a one-legged Messiah. It's an unbalanced relationship with Yeshua. A Torah Messiah-like observance depends upon a scriptural balance. It depends on our developing a balanced understanding of God in all his ways from Breshit or Genesis to Revelation. I don't think it was a mistake that Revelation says that you are blessed if you read from Revelation. Because it's the most avoided book. <laughs> and so... Maybe it was like a little motivation there, a little sugar on the, uh, on the scripture there, because there's a lot that we need to be reading in Revelation that's happening in our day. And then there's another spiritual defect. It's a broken foot. Now, if you're broken-footed, you're just not reliable. And that's the hardest thing about ministry, reliability. Oh, my goodness. Depending upon people. A lame person will have a walk that's not normal, not a normal walk, but a broken-footed person, they have no walk at all. They can't walk. And how many profess to be believers, Christians, Messianics, but there's nothing in their life that would support their profession of faith? You're not seeing it. I'm not witnessing a believer here. When the Ruach searches their hearts, there comes a discovery. You ever heard the term rhinos? Right? You've heard that? Politically rhinos? How about sinos? You know what sinos are? Christians in name only. Sinos. Yeah. Everybody's a believer, everybody's going to heaven. We're taking the dogs with us. Everybody's going to heaven. Right. They are spiritual cripples who find it much easier to make excuses or to depend on others to offer what we should be offering him in our own walk. Confidence, we read from Proverbs 25, 19, in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth or a foot out of joint. Broken-footed, unreliable. The next spiritual defect, broken-handed. Broken-handed. And really what that means is an inability to grasp hold of things, spiritually. To get a hold of something. You know, get a hold of it. The uh, truths for these individuals slip out of reach, and eventually they end up in error themselves. Do you have... Do you ha Let's just do the simple one here. Do you have brothers and sisters that are Christians, believers? Right, you have friends, right? Born again, spirit-filled, on-fire Christians, right? Have you ever tried to talk to them about Shabbat? <laughs> How'd that go for you? <laughs> How'd that go for you, right? They, they can't grab hold of that reality because in their heads they're thinking, how could the church be wrong for all these years? How could they be wrong? <laughs> right. Because for them, the church is the final authority in their life. In their life, it's the church because they're closet Catholics. They can't, they can't get a hold of that. So then they continue in error themselves. Therefore, reading from Hebrews 2.1, we must pay much more careful heed to the things that we have heard so that we will not let them slip from our grasp. Generally, the best students, right, who are the best students? Right, come on. Some of you were better students, others were not so good as students, right? I can tell you where I sat. Where I sat? Right next to the good note taker. I'm admitting it. There were, no there, was, there were boys and girls that were better note takers than me. You sit close to them. You ask them, hey, can I see your notes? Right? Note takers. The best students are the best note takers. Watch Ms. Moika sometime. 
That woman writes down everything. <laughs> She's a note taker. We need to get into the habit of writing down things so as to not forget them. Yeshua said, listen very carefully to what I'm going to say. You would think if God is speaking to you, you would do that by default, right? The sad thing is he had to make that statement. Hey, you got to listen carefully to God speaking. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, good idea. Pay close attention to what you are being taught. Grab hold of these truths with intent and purpose and application. That's very interesting, Rabbi. I have to think about that. Why don't you apply it? Why don't you actually do it? The, other, the next spiritual defect that Yochanan read for us from this morning's parasha is a hunched back. A hunched back. And usually, that kind of represents somebody who can't bear burdens, right? Because life is full of challenges and burdens. That's a humpbacked person. In the, you know, on movies we'd call it the hunchback. Which reminds us of a woman in Luke 13 who had to be straightened up by the master. Your posture, brothers and sisters, says so much about you. So much about you. How, how you feel. How often do you feel beaten down by life? We appear to be carrying the weight of the world, some of you. Do you feel like that sometimes? Well, sure you do. And there's a, we're weighted by a lot of stuff in the world. That's not making fun of that, but it shows. The nonverbal shows. Psalm 55, 22, unload your burden on Adonai. My wife will tell you, I say, just put it on the altar. You can't carry that. You were meant to carry that. Put it on the altar. Unload your burden on Adonai, and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. The Lord is your strength and shield, your strong tower and buckler. He is a shield about you, your refuge and deliverer. Trust him. Trust him. Cast your cares on the Lord. Because he cares for you. And rest in his faithfulness. There's another spiritual defect. Stunted growth. Stunted growth. An individual who never really fully grows up to the stature that God desires or intends for you. Ask yourself the question, are you, have you aspired to the stature that God wants you to aspire to? Are, have, have you grown to the place that God wants you to grow to? Are you there? You know, we, we see little people, right? Some are called dwarfs. Some are called midgets. There's actually a difference. There's a difference. A dwarf is one who doesn't grow properly, whereas a midget they're perfectly formed, they're just a little smaller. That's all, they're just smaller people. That's all it is. Either way, Rabbi Shaul in his letter to Ephesus says, God expects growth. God expects growth. We will then no longer be infants tossed about by the waves and blown along by every wind of teaching at the mercy of people clever in devising ways to deceive us. I heard a pastor uh, say, it was a shocking revelation. He was talking about Joel Osteen, and he was saying, he said that uh, Joel Osteen is judgment. He's judgment for those who had not grown to the point where they can discern what they're hearing is true or not. That's their judgment to be continually fed from him 
and the people that are with him. That's God's judgment upon those people. That was a sharp word, but I think it's right. Stunted growth. Be ever pursuing growth. Allow God to stretch you, to study, to prep you, to practice. The next spiritual defect. I, 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 um, I'm an optometrist, you know, and he just, when I go get an eye exam, he just like, I watch him go back in his chair. He sits back and goes, dude, how do you see? <laughs> I mean, with the optometrist, just, he looks, I mean, I'm looking at my eyeballs right there. He's got them on a computer screen. He's going, he's looking at both eyes. He's going, what the heck? I've never seen anything this bad. He goes, it is an absolute miracle that you are able to see. He said, you see that, you know, by the size of a hair, you are a hair from being blind in one eye. A hair. If your retina is attached just a little bit further to the optical nerve, you're done. It's, <laughs> in fact, I'm going to go get, you know, because he's retiring, I'm going to go get a... Uh, Pictures. He's going to print me off the pictures just so I have them. <laughs> he goes, goodness. I've had everything done. I've had four detached retinas. I have both, cat you know, both lenses replaced. And uh, cataracts. Blind spots. Blind spots. Do you have blind spots? Hypocrisy. That's a blind spot. Preach, Hypocrisy. A person who has a spot or defect in his eyes. They're not blind. They just don't see clearly or properly. Anybody ever had a, a cataract? Anybody, just raise your hand, a cataract? You got a new lens? Was that amazing when you put that new lens in? You go, oh my gosh. I remember the first time I got a lens replacement, and, and like it was a snowy day, and I'm going like, whoa. It was like crystal crisp clear. It was like... It was unbelievable. I had no idea how cloudy my vision really was, how, how badly I was really seeing until that lens was replaced and I could see clearly. See clearly. We need to have clear spiritual vision to see the path the Lord has marked out for us to follow. For many of us, our vision is hindered. We have blind spots of pride, of ego, of hypocrisy. You think you're seeing. You're not. You're not seeing very well. And it happens slowly. A cataract grows over time. It's a really slow process. You don't realize that it's, it's, you're, you're, you're losing your vision in that eye until the day you replace that lens and you go, oh, my gosh. How did I, how did I, how, how did I see anything? People critical of blemishes in others' lives, though, of course, are frequently oblivious to their own inability to see as well. You must learn to deal mercifully with people whose ability to witness truth is clouded. Being constantly reminded that our own spiritual vision has been at one time or another defected as well, clouded by false doctrine man-made traditions that we so embrace. Festering sores. Festering sores, that sounds kind of gross. But that has to do with diet. It's a skin condition. Uh, the New King James Version and the New American Standard Version describes it as an itch or eczema. Those who suffer skin conditions do so from a lack of something missing in their diet or exposure to the wrong chemicals or foods, like sa'arat, which is a biblical leprosy, an outward manifestation of an inward condition. Sometimes our outward spiritual appearance is unattractive because of an inward lack of fellowship or communion with the Lord and or a steady diet of his word. 
What are you chewing on? What are you eating? Skin conditions are a result of being spiritually undernourished. Undernourished. And our spirits crave. They crave spiritual nourishment, not the spiritual junk food that's served up in so many pulpits today. Empty calories, empty theology. It's like eating sugar. It's all tasty and sweet. When a believer has no appetite for God, no hunger to worship with other believers, no steady diet of Torah or prayer, we need to explore what they have actually been ingesting. A good diet, brothers and sisters, anybody will tell you in the physical will produce health. So the same in the spirit, a good spiritual diet will produce a healthy countenance. And we'll see it. I'm telling you, feed on quality teaching. Avoid teaching that feels and tastes good. Sometimes the best medicine tastes horrible. The next spiritual defect, scabs. Right. Scab. What does that mean? Something. You cut yourself or you fell or something, right? And usually that's a very sensitive area, right? And we have sensitive areas in our lives. Some areas in our life we're very sensitive to. If you poke that area, oh, ho, ho. You're going to get a reaction you didn't expect, right? Right. Sore hand, sore finger, touching. Well, you're going to get some ungodly reactions. So a scab or a wound is what? It is in the process of healing. And so to mess with it can be painful. People are wounded and in the process of healing can be very touchy people, can be very oversensitive. They can be easily, as we talked about last week, easily offended. Easily offended. If that is you, allow God to clean that wound out. Allow him to heal it. Great peace have they that love the Torah, we read in Psalms, and nothing shall offend them. Allow God to search your inner being and heal those hidden hurts all of us suffer with. We've all got a hidden hurt. Allow God to heal that. Because we certainly don't want to be poked in it, do we? No. And finally, there is the eunuch. The eunuch. Gosh, my poor daughter. Oh, my gosh. Years ago, when she would read from the Torah, when she was here, she... I gave her that Torah portion to read. <laughs> she goes, you want me to read what? <laughs> In front of people? <laughs> that was pretty funny. You don't mind, do you? <laughs> but we have broken testicles or crushed testicles. Therefore, what does that do? Compromise the ability to reproduce. It's big boys and girls here. And God requires fruit. We can't be just spectators in our faith. He requires that we are active participants in what he is doing. Well, God's doing a wonderful work. Yeah, he's doing it through you and others. That's where God works. He works through the body. He requires us in our faith to be active in his cause. Right now we read in Yochanan or John 15, because of the word which I have spoken to you, you are pruned. Stay united with me as I will with you. For just as the branch can't put forth fruit by itself apart from the vine, so you can't bear fruit apart from me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who stay united with me and I with them are the ones who bear much fruit because apart from me, you can't do a thing. Nothing of any great value, certainly eternal value. We must be ready for pruning even if it's painful at times and it doesn't look like it's a lot of fun when I prune the trees and branches and bushes out of my house. 
I think to myself, well, that's got to hurt. <laughs> right? It's got to. So it's understandable when God prunes us that it's going to be painful at times. But what does pruning facilitate? Facilitates growth. Facilitates fruitfulness. And that's what God wants from you and I. Fruitfulness. We've got to reject any thoughts of independence from God. We must be increasingly deepening our relationship with Yeshua. Reading again from Yohanan 15, if you remain united with me and my words with you, then ask whatever you want and it will happen for you. This is how my Father is glorified in your bearing much fruit. How do we further the kingdom? Bearing fruit. Amen? And the way you do that is you abide in the Lord continually so that you will bear much fruit. I'm going to wrap this up for you. Priests at that time, time of the temple, they didn't identify with what was going on in the world. They didn't identify with worldly imperfection. That wasn't their world. They were cognizant of the world outside the temple. But that wasn't their identity. That wasn't their life. That isn't how they saw life. They were instruments of God's atoning work. And thereby, the priest expected, even demanded, that you bring your best. Because remember, I've told you this numerous times. This gives you this is a, a, a clarion example of how the body of Messiah has changed their understanding of going to services, whether Sunday or Saturday. It's all it's 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 just one 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 eighty. Because of the time in the temple, you gave to give. You came to bring an offer. You came to bring your best. But today we come to get the best, get something from God, want something from God. That's why we come into services. Oh, God, I need, I want. Now, that's who we should go to, but that's generally the first priority. And Mr. Wonderful standing up here will say, I'll show you how to get what you want from God. Repeat after me. And that's how it works. I want to live forever. Okay, yeah, say these words. I need some money. Well, that's good. Here, say these scriptures. And that's what's happening. But the priest, that isn't the way it worked with them. You were coming to bless God. And the priest expected, demanded that you bring the best of what you have. If you had flocks or herds, what would you look for? Eh, that one's not going to make it. I'll bring that one. Right? No, you would look around and go, that's the best one of the herd right there. That one right there. I'm going to bring my very best. I'm going to give God the very best what I had to offer. The, the uh, firstborn, Pidyan Haben, bringing the firstborn, your firstborn son, dedicating it to the Lord, him to the Lord. That's what the priest expected and demanded. That's where our identity lies spiritually, with he who is the perfect, who is perfect. That's Yeshua. Yeshua who lived the only perfect and sinless life ever who prepared the way for imperfect people just like you, just like me, to f and be fully accepted by God because of his perfection. Amen. We read from Hebrews, Arim, for if sprinkling ceremonially unclean persons with the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer restores their outward purity, then how much more than the blood of Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself to God as a sacrifice without blemish, will purify our conscience from works that lead to death so that we can serve the living God. On our own, brothers and sisters, because of our imperfections, we cannot approach God and serve him in the way that he requires. It takes perfection to repair perfection. When we trust in Yeshua, 
and his perfect offering on our behalf, what sin and rebellion broke can then be repaired. And we can be made acceptable to God once more, blemishes and all, defects and all. You know, one day, the day is coming where there will be the resurrection of the dead and the day of redemption. That is, the physical and the spiritual problems, the defects associated with sin will end. And we will be perfect in soul and body. Yeshua handles both of those defects. The spiritual kind we can take care of right now by faith. The physical kind we've got to wait on. But it will happen. But until that moment... The best preparation that we can do to ready ourselves for that day is provide him your very best day by day. Please rise. Let's pray. So that's the question the Holy Spirit is challenging us with today. And we hear you, Lord, because the Holy Spirit is saying, hey, did you bring your best? Did you bring your best effort? Did you bring your best attitude? Did you bring your best offering? Have you done your best to bless me and to bless others? Is that your best? Is that what you got? Father, when we leave this world, can we honestly say, I did my best. I gave you my best. I praised you from the depths of my heart. I worship you. I applied myself. I read your word. I, I listened to the rabbi. I served in the congregation. I did whatever I can to bring my best in awe to you, Yeshua. But nothing more no other agenda but just to be a blessing unto you. I hope and pray, Father, there are areas where we are slacking, maybe. Maybe we are unbalanced. Maybe we're not even moving at all in our walk with you. And perhaps, Father, this will motivate us, Father, to see more clearly, to live a more balanced and motivated and fruitful life for the kingdom. I can hope and pray, Father, that's what happens. We'll continue to believe and trust, and we'll ask your Holy Spirit, Father, to guide and order our way in such a way, Father, that we can accomplish all this, because we can't do it on our own flesh. But by your Spirit, all things are possible. And we pray these things in Yeshua's name, and the congregation agrees. Yivarech Yahweh, Vayishmerecha, Sadonai Panavalecha Vichanecha, Sadonai Panavalecha, Vesimlecha, Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And I pray the Lord to lift his countenance upon you and he will grant you his shalom. B'Shem Yeshua Adonai. And the congregation agrees? Amen. Amen. Shabbat shalom.